a lot of people make money so that they can afford to do what they love. For me, that's one and the same. The fact that I am fulfilled and passionate on a day-to-day basis and monetizing that, you know, it's, it's just like, why would I unplug it? That's, this is what I would be doing if I wasn't getting paid. going on you're listening to episode 63 of the perspective podcast and i'm your host scotty russell of perspective collective this show is about carving out time to build something for yourself and about being open to seeing things from a different perspective i want to share what is and isn't working for me along with sharing my guest point of view tickets are now available for creative south conference april 12th through 14th and registration is open for my two-part workshop on how to craft and deliver a killer talk And I should note, there are a ton of other awesome workshops available too if this one doesn't interest you. And there's also options to be a sponsor or you can even be a volunteer for a discounted conference ticket rate. Uh, This conference is the reason why I've gotten to where I am today. And I don't even feel slightly guilty about sharing this with you over and over again because I know the value it can bring you. Get more information or buy your tickets at creativesouth.com. I promise you will not regret this. Also, before we get into the show, I want you to know that I started a Facebook group called The Perspective-Collective. It's been extremely hard for me to keep up with every email or message you've sent me, especially when you know I find myself repeating the same response over and over again. And for this reason, that's why I created a group is to like funnel all my responses and hopefully address a group you know, as a whole. And hopefully potentially help more than one person at a time and get to people easier if it's all in one place. And it's also a community for you to share your work, get critiques and encouragement and have direct access to me and other creatives who are like minded trying to, you know, push their creative careers. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, go search on Facebook, the Perspective Dash Collective and join the team and make a a side Facebook account if you don't use Facebook. Just do it just so you can be a part of this community. Today's episode features a really good friend of mine who I've watched blow up over the last few years. Adam Vicarell is not only an insanely talented lettering artist and brand designer, but he has a gift for fusing his interests and his personality into his work, which has landed in some notable clientele like Sharpie. He's a super down-to-earth dude who does larger-than-life work, and he doesn't hold back with the value in this episode. You can find the show notes of this episode at perspective-collective.com slash 63. And if you think someone can find value in this episode, please give it a share on social media. It's because of your word of mouth that this show keeps on growing, and you know I love you for it. Finally, if you catch some inspiration from the show, create some work and tag me on Instagram. I've been sharing it over on my Perspective Podcast Instagram page, and I will give you credit. Let's get into the show. All right, what's going on? Today, I'm joined by one of my good homies from the early Instagram days, Adam Vicarell. Adam, how you doing, man? About time we've made this happen. Yeah, really. I'm, I'm, I'm good, man. It's good to finally meet. It's yeah. been a long time coming. We've had so many little micro interactions, but never anything face to face. So it's like the, your voice sounds so manly and smooth. <laughs> yeah, smooth. Like, I know it's like a creamy butter, you know, let's just dive right in. Please tell us a little bit about yourself, a quick little brief Wikipedia page summary, if you can. Yeah. Uh, so I, uh, studied graphic design, graduated in 2000, uh, 2011, uh, worked for about two and a half years as an in-house designer for a promotional merchandising group. Loved the job, but I was getting creatively stagnant. So I took off, traveled for about a year. So that was around 2014, beginning of 2014. That's when I got into hand lettering and uh, landed in Denver after that year where I really started to push the lettering. And for the last three, four years, I've been working for myself, doing lettering, illustration, branding, kind of a little bit of everything, murals. You were from Cleveland first, right? Yeah, originally from Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, born and raised uh, in Cleveland, went to school in Dayton, Ohio. Um, So yeah, most of my life has been in Ohio, aside from really the past four years. Why Denver? A good friend, one of my best girlfriends, Kelsey Fagan from college. Um, She was a designer at an agency, 
they frequently used freelancers and she just suggested, you know, Hey, I know you just traveled. No, you don't necessarily want to live in Cleveland right now, which Cleveland's got a bad rap. It's a great city. Cleveland's dope. I went to WMC fest there this last August and I, I thought it was great. Yeah. It's, it's such a great city. Um, but at the time I was just, I was just ready. So ready for something new. So I kind of did the classic, uh, you know, no job, no home, no money, move out to Denver and, uh, you know, was freelancing with this agency, which ended up being about part time for a year. And, uh, things kind of just slowly started to fall into place once I got out to Denver. When did you make that leap then to freelance full time? And like, what made you take the leap without having, you know, something set up? Did you have like student loan debt or anything like that? I do not have student loan debt. So I'm, I'm very, very fortunate in that regard. When I came out to Denver, the intention was to freelance at this agency for a month and then find a job with some other agency where, working as a designer. Once I got out here, that's when I f- got my first feature on uh, Caligra type and then on good type. Shout out to Dennis. Yep. Shout yeah. out to Dennis and Brooke. Dennis Cortez and Brooke. Those two features lit the fire and I got very, very just encouraged by that. I, I literally think it was those two features that then made me think like, huh, like maybe I can do more with lettering than just do it for fun in the evenings and mornings. Because for a while I was doing 14 to 18 hour days, like literally burning the candle from both ends, lettering in any spare second that I had. Uh, I was absolutely terrible at it, like really fucking bad at it when I started. And uh, it's just, it was, yeah, yeah, you were, but so was <laughs> I, man. That's that's how we linked up at the same time. We literally became obsessed with hand lettering and that new little boom. I started in 2013, and then 2014 is like when it really started picking up. You know, and that's when I think I discovered you and like Bob Ewing back in the early days, and yeah, I got the homie Joey Bearbauer into it too. So, and that's this is this is coming out to you as it comes out to the worldwide. When I first found your work. I remember seeing you were kind of doing lettering around like gym and workout stuff. Yeah. And I was, I was like, who is this fucking meathead who's coming in the lettering world? <laughs> oh my, I still, I still get that, man. I still get that. I love it though. I love it. No, it's, it's, I mean, you have like, you know, the, like the football, like motivational, like workout guy. I have like the kind of like, you know, I'm getting lost and eating bugs in the woods side and <laughs> to, to pull the lettering into it. It's beautiful. I mean, yeah, I love it. It's just been a way to express because, man, I got so stagnant for the longest time and, you know, bored and was doing graphic design. And then, boom, here comes lettering. I'm like, holy shit, you know, I could maybe I could do something with this. So and then bring it in some type of illustration. But this shit isn't about me. This is about you. And since you've made the leap into freelance What are some of the high points and what are some of the low points? Because the perception you get just looking through someone's social media feed is like, oh, my God, this person's traveling all the time. Look at this dope ass client work he's had, you know, from the outside looking in. It looks like just sunshine and rainbows when I know that's not the case when I actually talk to people who are full time freelance. Yeah, there's a lot of dirt and wounds. You know, I, I loved having a nine to five job because for the most part, it enabled me to go to work and then leave work and then I'm done. Like I was there from nine to five and that was it. And then you'd have weekends where you weren't necessarily working unless you had passion projects or personal projects. When you're working for a company, you have project managers and you have an account team and you have you know, a creative team where you're delegating different projects. Everyone's got their own little jobs. And now you know, as a freelancer, I'm doing everything. So I'm finding new work. I'm putting together the invoices and contracts and creative briefs. I'm following up with clients and doing all the project management. And that's what every freelancer is doing. So the hardest part for me about being a freelancer has been learning the business side because I had no business experience. I took one marketing class in college and it was on Friday morning at 8 a.m., which I was never really all there. Let's just say that. Well, if you're like me, you went out on Thursday nights. Yeah, exactly. I was yeah hardly sober in that class. Sorry, I uh, forget. Mrs. Driscoll, I think was her name. <laughs> um, I got almost nothing out of that class to apply to what I'm currently doing. So just the the process of learning how to run a business efficiently has been the biggest obstacle. And for me, I really struggle with turning it off. I mean, I'll get up super early in the morning, I'll go to work, and I'll be in the studio until 7.30 or 8 sometimes. I get back to my house at 8.30 or 9 p.m., and I'm sitting down trying to like relax with the roommates, and I can't turn my brain off. All I'm thinking about is some other, you know, mural I'm designing or some personal project I want to work on, or I need to update my website. I feel you, dude. So there's that like mental burden that constantly has followed me as a freelancer, but 
I love it so much. So did you ever struggle with like pricing your work? Because that's probably one of the biggest things people ask me all the time. And I'm like, I don't do full-time freelance, but having the full-time job makes me extra more selective about work. And you know, if it's in demand, then I can charge more because I got to make it worth my time. But for you, was that a hard thing? You know, kind of charging what you felt you're worth? Do you do it hourly? Do you do value-based pricing or, you know, how do you uh, attack that whole avenue of things? Yeah, it's, it's definitely constantly evolving. I am trying to have more conversations with illustrators that I look up to in Denver, just because I think illustration and lettering, the way you price those things is very similar in that at least this is the way I intend to approach it, where you get paid to create the work and then license that design. So whether they're going to buy it outright, you know, they're going to pay a high price to own that, or if they want to do it, you know, just for a year or for two years, three years. So currently what I, I do is if I'm working with an agency around Denver, I have a couple agencies that I work with a good amount that I just charge hourly there. Most of my branding work I charge by, I have like a base rate for a branding project. And then depending how in-depth it is, you know, how much we're actually doing. Do you offer tiers of pricing? Like here's your basic one, basic two, basic three, or pro three kind of thing? Essentially, yes. Yeah. So, in, you know, obviously as you go up in price, they're getting more more stuff. Um, and I, I definitely try to push for the higher priced ones not to make more money, but it enables me to have a more like all-encompassing view of the brand and really implement it in a proper way. You know, it, it kills me when I do a beautiful branding project, send it off to the client, and then just watch them butcher it all over the web. It happens so frequently, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, it's like, why are you going to throw all this money at a beautiful brand and then just, you know, throw it in the mud? Uh, my buddy Colin Tierney, uh, he told me, it really it's worked well for me he he calls it your basic your pro and your professional plan and you kind of like highlight the professional one and kind of talk it up because the end user your client whatever they want to be professional so i mean that kind of highlighting it with that kind of terms so it's yeah, like, like tier that. one tier two tier three and that's worked out really well for me in the last year of applying that uh like what, what about doing contracts or how do you do like client discovery or walk people through how that works for you See, I'm, I'm asking these questions all on the fly because I want to know. So this shit wasn't even part of the structure. No, no, no worries at all. Um, because, you know, I've had the fortunate opportunity where I've worked with, I don't even know, 20 or so agencies between Cleveland and the, well, really all over the country, but a lot of them in Denver and Cleveland. So because I've worked with all of these agencies, I've gotten so many different contracts from them. And, you know, I've gone through their processes on how they do a branding project or a lettering project, whatever that may be. So I've been able to pick and choose what I like from each of these agencies and kind of consolidate that into something that works for me. Uh, I, I definitely would say that my one of my goals for this year is to run my contracts by an actual creative lawyer or someone who specializes in that. I haven't actually done that. Hopefully my clients aren't listening. Um, but it's like I, I have a, a contract that I've adopted from you know art directors that i've worked with but i i honestly don't, like, don't really know if it would hand stand up in the court of law you know mm -hmm. uh so a, a lot of that stuff it's like there's just so many moving parts and at any given time i'm not quite sure where i should really be allocating my energy and that's i think one of my one of my pet peeves of of freelancing is like i have to set that schedule and decide what's most important and it's yeah, any given day, it's not like I want to sit down and edit my contract today. Yeah, that's probably like the last thing. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to go and create a new piece or, you know, put something that's going to help the podcast scale. I'm not even thinking about legal side of things. Yeah, it's so boring. Yeah. I acknowledge it's important. It's just it falls to the wayside, unfortunately. Have you ever thought about getting an agent or do you like having that control of things? Like I know some people I know, they, they love having an agent. But I mean, they take a nice de decent portion out of it but at the same time i like people or i know people who want to have control over all of it yeah yeah i i very briefly had an agent it was a woman based in uh in texas that she currently only represents photographers and she wanted to expand so she was like hey you know let's let's get into illustration and design i met her through a, a mutual connection and nothing ever really came of it but i i thought it through for a while i didn't know if going agent for that exact reason where they take a big cut. But I, I like the idea of having an agent because they're finding work for me while I'm doing and finding work on my own. You know, the, the contract that I had with the agent that I didn't really work with, 
it basically said like adam you can go find your own work do your own thing as you currently are if i find you work that's when we actually split it mm -hmm. so for that reason it's you just have another person on your team you know helping you find work so ultimately i i'm not searching for an agent but if one happens to listen to this podcast and is like hey adam vicarell is perfect for me then you know get at me agent let's chat you uh something that really drew me to your account a while back that i struggled with I, I struggled like showing myself in my work and having you know my lifestyle still be a part of my personal brand i know that's like a gross word to people but shit that's true if you're going solo you're putting shit out there and you're making money off of it like you are your own personable brand how did you get to the point where you included travel and your photos and your lettering and your branding all into one because it's worked for you for me that that scared me in the beginning i thought i had to be this hyper curated version of myself and you know that works for some people but it doesn't work for me and i've learned to let like my love for pizza my love for cats and my love for outer space shine through my work when you're really good at letting your photos and your travel bug side of you you know shine through your work was that just something from the get-go that you're like fuck it i'm doing it this way and it is what it is first of all i do want to say that your your pizza cat stuff i love so much i'm like it's just such a beautiful thing that you push it's it's amazing it, it's weird it's like all that shit has been the best selling thing anything out there that has like a message or some context behind it flops but like anything pizza and cat related it's just it's weird to me pizza cat i can get behind that yeah basically that's how it is <laughs> um yeah i so i think i was fortunate in that i got into lettering so i did a five-month trip through southeast asia uh that was like right when i quit my first job and that was when i i didn't have a laptop with me so i was kind of freaked out by the idea of not being able to design for five months uh so i was like hey there's a huge demand for lettering in the design industry i'll give it a shot so i started lettering when i started traveling so they kind of were this like one in the same for me so as i was in asia that was when i was posting my first lettering stuff on instagram as well as pictures of me in you know thailand and Laos and vietnam whatever so I, it kind of just and that was before i was actually utilizing instagram as like a real resource i was kind of just posting stuff um so when i got back that's when I realized, okay, I can actually leverage this. I can get work from this. You know, how am I going to really use Instagram? And actually, I don't know if you remember, you and I actually very briefly talked about this and we were talking about Instagram. And I think it was on, we were on Slack and you made, I forget exactly what you said, but something to the effect of, you know, are you trying to be a letterer or are you like a travel guy? Cause I, I don't know which one it is from your Instagram. I thought that over and over. I'm like, oh shit, that's right. You know, I don't want to confuse people. What, what am I doing? And ultimately, I listened to a lot of different people talking about, you know, if you do four things, cooking, traveling, lettering, and ballet, you should have four Instagrams, one for each of those. But I also heard other people saying, no, your brand should be all encompassing and tell your whole story on one Instagram. I chose to go that latter route. So I naturally started lettering and traveling at the same time it had already kind of started with that theme and i just continued that moving forward you know it's funny is like i remember saying that i remember that conversation it's kind of what i want i wanted to bring it up because my mindset has shifted away now like curation is great but at the same time like showing the human side behind your brand i think is super important because half of these fucking feeds is just like a drawing, a drawing, a drawing, a drawing. I'm like, you have no idea who the human is behind that. Like, it's yeah. just pure cur curation and kind of robotic in a sense. And that's how I felt. I I operated until I started like showing my face on stories and posting photos of my cats and talking about my love for weird shit. You know, that's, I mean, I think that started connecting with people more. And I, I kind of want to just give you kudos that you've been sticking with that and doing it before I ever thought it was okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's... I. You know, people like to know, like you have this beautiful persona and like personality on the internet. And I think people want to know who you are. They want to see you. And I've, I've felt that way about people that I follow. You know, I think the hood sisters, uh, Amy and Jen hood, uh, they do an amazing job showing their personality. And it's like, they, I, I want to hang out with them so bad because yeah. they look like they're always just such a good time, such fun, amazing, genuine people. And the way they present themselves on the internet is something that I want, not that I want to do it in the same way, but it's like, I want my personality to show through 
when you look at my photos. And, and what do you think about people saying like, you are not your business. Like I am not perspective collective and perspective collective isn't Scotty Russell, but at the same time, like I, I feel, you know, your personal brand and your personality and your personal self do intertwine. You know what I mean? Have you heard that? Yes. And I actually, I've gotten a handful of projects or worked with a handful of clients that they said the reason that they hired me is because they loved my personality. And they're saying this from just scrolling through of through photos on Instagram and they feel like they know who I am. That's awesome. So, yeah. So it's, I'm, I'm going to continue. And that really resonated with me because I want to continue to leverage. If people think they are starting to know me, which is what I want. I, w- I want that to happen. I want that connection. I think that's a, a differentiator that I want to continue to leverage is that, that personability. And, you know, when you work with my company, we work with Vic Rail studios, which I don't really like put that out in the world, but when you're working with me, it's like, you get me, you know, you get my, I'm a weird, weird person. Uh, and you get some of that personality and you know, I'm going to say something outlandish and I might say something that's borderline inappropriate, but it'll be like just okay enough. That's why we vibe well, man. That's why we vibe <laughs> well. I feel like I'm the same. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to keep pushing that cause it's working currently. You know, how, how would you suggest someone who's just getting started, you know, a kind of attack building their Instagram feed? I've done one blog post ever and (laughs) (laughs) I'll link it up in the show notes. That shit was a heater. I bet. Yeah, it was. No, it was great. I love, I love writing. I don't know why I don't do it. We, I mean, we, again, we talked about this a long time ago, but uh, to your question, I would, one of the things I say in that blog is for me, one of the best things I did for myself was not overthinking anything. Well, I loved to travel and I knew I loved lettering. So without having any real intent, without trying to, set goals are very important, but without trying to set all these goals, I just lettered and talked about travel and just did it, just started doing it. And that starts to build that following and people start to understand, you know, your ideas and who you are and maybe what your philosophy is around design or your content that you're creating. And I think as you do that, things start to fall into place. So you'll start to get a little bit more clarity on what you're doing as you're actually doing it. And once that clarity starts to you know, come into light or once you get that understanding, then you can start to set those goals and be like, okay, you know, for me that, uh, played out where I love traveling. I loved lettering and illustration. So I was just doing a bunch of it. And then eventually I saw this opportunity, like, Oh, maybe I can tap into the outdoor industry. You know, this style of design that I do is very relevant. It's kind of rustic and feels a little bit gritty in an intentional way. Um, so then I started targeting the outdoor industry. And so I, I think, to consolidate what I just said, just doing stuff without overthinking for me was one of the best things that I ever did. And once that clarity starts to form, then go into it with more intent and direction. Dude, that's, that's gold. I could have used that blog post before I got started. Cause literally the main thing that I, I say, one of my biggest weaknesses is overthinking things and feeling like I had to be this brand and then keep Scotty separate. Like I couldn't let those weird puns and Uh, that weird crossing the line of saying something that might just be a little offensive. Like I didn't even swear in my brand for the first couple years yet. I swear. What is it? Swear like a sailor. Is that the saying? I almost said soldier, but maybe soldier swear too, but they probably do. I'm sure. But that that's, that's gold in itself. And that's something I still have a hard time is overthinking it, but I'm getting better. So like that's, I feel like that's a skill in itself just putting shit out there. And the thing I try to like recommend people doing now that I've kind of figured it out for the most part, you know, air quotes with figure it out. But I I say put out work that resonates with you that, you know, pour yourself into your work, your soul, your DNA, your experiences. And that's how you're going to attract like-minded people instead of creating shit that you think people want to see. That's what got me in big trouble a while ago. And if something flopped that I put out there, you know, I'd tear myself down. I'd beat myself up because how could I have thought this was a good idea? So that is awesome. Like don't overthink it and just pour your true self into your work and not, not care about what anybody else is going to think. Yes. And it's to to what you're saying, the you part, like the, the person that you are coming through in your work, I think is, is huge as well. Even if you don't, if I think a lot of people when they get started, don't really know who they are again, air quotes there, or like, you know, what they want to say or what they want to, you know, how they want to convey themselves. And I, I think overthinking that is going to just, it's going to delay any actual execution. That whole saying of done is better than perfect mm-hmm. or you, the Wayne Gretzky, you miss 90, hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Uh, all that stuff applies in this design sense. So 
will not only delay it, but it paralyzes you. Yes, 100%. You, you start playing it safe. Yep, when safe is not the way to go in an art and design world. No, no, you gotta risk it for the biscuit. Yeah, or, <laughs> and or I, tris- everybody trisket. loves the biscuits. <laughs> 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 Uh, something I, I had a, a one-on-one call with Andy J. Miller because I was stuck on this for a while. If anybody knows, I'm a huge creative pep talk fan. It, he talks about finding yourself in your work, and I think you're an absolute pro at that. I think we're maybe the same age. I'm 29. 29. I'm 29. Yeah, but I feel like you're so much light years ahead of me, even though that's not a reference in time of like finding yourself early on in your work and how it's been benefiting you now. So it's like something I've always envied of you. I think that's a grass is always greener thing. Cause I look at you, I'm like, look at this dude slaying. Like you, what it was it a year and a half ago, you started this podcast and you're like, oh, I think I'm going to try this. Now a year and a half later, you're talking to like the forefathers group. <laughs> Those are the some... homies, man. I'm drinking out of a glass from them right now. Yeah. They're insane. Dude, they're... they're the shit, man. You got to come to a conference and come and kick it with I all know. these guys. That's so much fun. Like, dude, you would shred it on stage. You're teaching a workshop. You've done the good type workshop at South by Southwest. That was dope as hell. Like have, and you've done lots of other kind of local workshops, but have you thought about getting more into the conference scene? Because that's honestly what's helped my, whatever career I'm having right now, it's helped me explode from my little office in Iowa. Like, oh my God, you'd be like a little celebrity at these conferences. Yeah, I and mean, I would love to, um, you know, unfortunately I was planning on going to uh, Creative South this year and I accidentally, I, you know, travel a lot. So I accidentally booked a trip to Mexico and was in Mexico for that weekend for 2018 for 20 so this past year what about 2018 i haven't looked into it but i should be able to i'm doing um the crop I'm you're going gonna be a crop. crop yes i'm gonna be a crop. teaching a workshop there oh nice yeah so I'll be a crop and i i do want to reach out to more people because i love i've given a lot of talks are you familiar with ladies wine and design um it's it's a, a group that jessica uh jessica walsh of stagmeyer and walsh put together um and so they're all they're in cities all over the country or all over the world actually and it's just all about empowering women in the creative industry. Dope. Uh, and the the place that I teach my hand lettering workshops hosted this event, and they they were talking about the side hustle, which is what my blog post that I was talking about is on. But I went and chatted with these ladies about about what I do and how I got into it. And talking to them, it like reiterated to me how much I love, you know, telling my story and talking to people who are passionate about a similar whether it's something creative or just entrepreneurship in general. So that kind of reignited that flame. And I really want to reach out to people that either run these conferences or that have a part in them. Cause I would love to talk and tell my story or tell a story in general. I've seen a lot of sponsored posts by you lately. Mm -hmm. I think Linux air, maybe your Sharpie deal. What's your process for pitching and working with these kind of clients? Because I know a lot of people are trying to get more into attracting sponsored posts like i wouldn't even mind having something like that you know are are these people who contact you first and then how do you write a proposal and pitch it so i've been fortunate that my my instagram has worked for me in that regard Uh, i haven't both sharpie and lennox i didn't pitch to them they approached me i mean honestly this kind of goes back to the whole like doing the work that comes truly from you and speaks to you Uh, sharpie approached me because they they said that they love that I do different styles of lettering on different materials. So, you know, I got into lettering by drawing on maps. So they've seen me draw on maps. They've seen me draw on wood. They've seen me draw on glass. So all these different materials and all of this is just me messing around, experimenting with stuff that I am just interested by. So through that self-exploration, uh, that's kind of how I landed that opportunity. The, the Lennox situation, both of these opportunities, these companies uh, ad agencies approach me. So not Sharpie or Lennox directly, okay. but Sharpie and Lennox's ad agencies. The, the Sharpie one made sense, but the Lennox one just seemed totally random. But how you've how you've like brought it in, I even saw uh Brooke at Good Type featured one of your Lennox pieces and I'm like, boom, you just like you, you just made their investment totally worth it on that one. So it, the Lennox one, um again an op- or a situation of posting the work that speaks to you or that you represents you at the end of the call with the the creative director I was talking to, I just asked them, you know, how did you guys come across my work or, you know, why me? So many people letter, so many people are better at this than I am. So many better letters. Yep. So many better letters out there. Um, and he said that one of their, uh, one of the art directors there followed my work and just threw my name in the bucket just completely randomly. 
And the creative director said, you know, we looked at a few photos, we loved your personality. So, you know, we thought we'd give you a shot. So again, that personality that he felt that he was like knew me through a few photos. I've been very fortunate that Instagram has really allowed me a lot of really amazing opportunities that I would not have otherwise come across. And I continue, I, I, I treat Instagram as a, as part of my job. You know, yeah. it's, it's like, I have to set aside time to do it because it does bring in work, you know, not necessarily like sales of prints and stuff like here and there, I get some sales on my online shop, but it's more about giving exposure to other creatives that work at agencies that may suggest me or want to work with me. No, that that's awesome. Honestly, you've grown so much in the last couple of years. It's been insane watching you take off and the clients you've been landing. It's, it's been a fucking wild ride, man. Hasn't it? Yes. It's, it's so scary. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah. That's a good thing. Wild. Like, like we, we should be scared of what's going to happen next. Cause if you're not scared of like big things coming down the pipeline, then I feel like you're just passively existing, you know? Yes. And that's, I listened to a talk that Aaron Drapling gave a long time ago. It was when he did the work for the Obama campaign. Yeah. And his quote was be ready when the big leagues call. And to that point, you know, he's basically just saying like, put in the time up front so that when the big opportunity lands in your lap, you're ready to execute. I've just applied that mentality to a lot of what I've done over the last year. Um, you know, I, ju I just did a, if you're familiar with the company Craftsy, I did an online course with them. So I now have this online course that'll live forever on the internet that I will be, you know, making passive income from, which I'm very excited about. Although being in front of a camera, like five cameras on a actual production set. Yeah. I saw that on your Instagram stories and stuff. Yeah. So scary. I literally was like physically scared, trembly. It's terrible. Wait till the day you're on stage on like create a South or something like that. And you got like six to 800 people there with spotlights on you. I'll black out. So where do you see your personal brand, Vicarell Studios in five to 10 years? You know, where, where are you trying to take it? But I know you're going to be flexible and open to like shit, totally manifesting its own path, you know, but like, where would you envision seeing it in five to 10 years? I originally thought I was going to study painting in college. Uh, I really loved painting. Um, but so I debated for a long time if I wanted to go the fine art route or the design route. Ultimately, I chose design because it was quote unquote safer. Um, you know, you could always paint on the side. So my passion of fine arts, I want to continue to like fuse that with my design work. So a lot of that comes through in my hand lettering. Um, you know, the way I do murals, I want to continue to push mural work. Um, I, I love doing lettering that's ultimately created into, you know, signage or wooden steel pieces. Yeah. So I think it's continuing to push that fusion. Um, but how that'll actually look like, you know, maybe running a design shop that has, I, I never want to be a big studio or shop. I want it to be just a couple people. So I think my first hire would be a project manager and account person, uh, maybe a junior designer after that. But yeah, five, 10 years, I hope to have a, a beautiful wife, maybe a baby. Um, and so, someone who is, has a flexible schedule that they can kind of travel with me. You know, I don't intend to travel my whole life all the time, but having that flexibility of being able to pick up, you know, work, I'm going to be working in Mexico and South America later this year. So the ability to do that and hopefully have a wife who can follow along and do that with me. That's the, that's the goal. That's dope. Well, speaking of travel, like how do you even manage, do you, do you do a lot of freelance when you're traveling or do you like you know, bust your ass in certain portions of a season or of a quarter to get you to a spot where, you know, you got a, a little money padded up that you can take like a month off and go do your thing. Mm -hmm. uh, more so the, the latter. I, I basically save up money and then go, you know, the, that first big trip I took where I was in Asia and then took some time off for, it was about 11 months off. Um, and I just saved up all of my money before I did that. I basically spent it all as well. And then when I did a, I did a trip to, to Europe and Iceland and then spent a couple months snowboarding where I just didn't work, but that was all saving up money before I went. Uh, my sister actually used to mock me because when I was saving my money, I stopped buying things like avocados and feta cheese because like I, I didn't need that. So she's like, Adam, you're, spend, you're saving like $3 at the grocery store by cutting those things out. And she mocked me, but it was more so not that I was saving those $3 as much as it was that mental change into a like a saver's mindset so i was just cutting out any extraneous costs that i didn't need to 
like for a while I was just when I'd go out with friends I would take a flask of whiskey to the bar with me oh my god I still do that (laughs) (laughs) but yeah I mean it's like saving money in little spots like that because then when I go travel it's like yeah I'm spending my money but it's like I saved so much while I was like preparing for this but I do intend in Mexico I'm going to Mexico in March and then South America at the end of the year both of those trips I'm intending to actually work kind of part-time but with the mindset of you know making dollars spending pesos um so yeah I'll be able to work 20 hours a month and fund my travels but Damn. I really want to talk to like Lauren Hom or yeah. I don't know if you know the illustrator uh Andrew Colin Beck um, I know Lauren Andrew uh he traveled for like a year with his family and he was you know illustrating as he traveled Lauren I've never talked to her before, but at least the impression I get is that for like a year she traveled and was working, you know, mm-hmm. freelance. So how to exactly navigate that, I don't really know. I've never really tried it to like fully work and fully travel. Or like like Gemma O'Brien or, or like Lauren Hom, you know, they will travel and do like a workshop someplace or do yeah. a mural on location. Like that's totally you, man. Mm-hmm. So yeah, ho- hopefully trying to trying to do that because the, the separation is tough because I work so hard before I go where I'm like basically burnt out mm-hmm. and then I go 100% vacation mode and I'm gone for, you know, four months and then I come back and I'm used to, you know, taking my days slow in Germany and like drinking coffee with this Polish couple and talking about our philosophies on life and, and then I come back and everyone's like nine to five, work your ass off, like make money to pay the bills that transition from this beautiful slow pace of life to back to reality is it there's this like weird feeling of depression that i'm like ah oh, this sucks i don't want this so i need to figure out a way to combine them better than separating them completely i know you said you have a hard time turning off your mind are you ever able to unplug when you're back in the states or is it like the constant grind? Because honestly, I have such a hard time unplugging, turning my mind off. Like I lose, I have to keep a sketchbook next to me because before I go to bed or I'm about to crash, I'll have a good idea and I have to like wake up and sketch it out. And, you know, outside the day job and then the podcast and freelance, it's hard to find time to even do personal work. Like, are you able to really ever unplug? And do you really have time these days to even focus on personal work? First, I just want to say that I have so much respect for you for balancing all of what you do and you have a, like a wife that, that is you have so many moving parts and it's very impressive what you might be like basically dying right now sometimes but- <laughs> I'm, I'm working on cutting things back honestly like i've talked about in episodes too like i, I i've kind of driven myself into the ground at times so it's definitely not something to brag about at all like i'm looking to do less but better yeah but to, to your question um i really i really really struggle with like turning it off and unplugging and getting away from it. Um, that is a goal of mine is to be better at that this year. I mean, I'll probably be traveling for about three or four months this year. So I think I'll have a good opportunity to do just that. Um, but I, I exercise almost daily, uh, which is a great opportunity to just unplug, you know, whether that's going for a run or rock climbing, skateboarding, You're snowboarding, such whatever. Such a beefcake, man. Yeah. Dude, did you see these triceps and these delts oh my god you, how much do you deadlift man <laughs> um but stuff like that is what helps me kind of like retain my sanity you know i'm fortunate in that you know i think i'm speaking for us both here that i am so passionate about what i do that it doesn't feel it doesn't always feel like work i mean i really really when i got home from christmas break i was back in cleveland when i got back to denver I was like jonesing to get back in the studio and start working again. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, yes, I struggle to unplug, but a lot of times I don't really want to unplug. You know, I want to keep going. I feel you. And it becomes an addiction when you get the validation, the affirmation, you see the progress. Like it's, it's hard enough finding the two things of finding something that you love and finding something that you're good at. But then when you're yeah, able little. to, add, yeah, 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 the sweet spot. But then when you're able to add that third ingredient where you find a market for these things, like, I mean, how do you ever turn it off? Like, are we in that state where we need to grind now so we can enjoy the fruits of our labor later? I tell myself that, but damn, I'm going to be that 60 year old still grinding. Oh, yeah. you know, I don't know. I'm how- not retiring. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to be like a Doyle Young by the time I'm like 60 or something like, or Ken Barber or something, that's what I'm aiming for. That's, that's a good goal to set. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's I I, th- I think a lot of people like this is like a way longer story than I'm going to get into, but like I think a lot of people feel because we do what we love and make money doing it. Yeah, you know, a lot of people make money so that they can afford to do what they love. For me, that's one and the same. I mean, yes, I love other things outside of design, but the fact that I am fulfilled and passionate on a day-to-day basis and monetizing that, you know, it's it's just like why would I unplug it? That's this is mm-hmm. what I would be doing if I wasn't getting paid. So, it's you know, it's a it's a huge blessing to have that as an opportunity to to be in a position where I can do that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more man it, it's it's a true blessing like i'm still working on getting to that point where i can do perspective collective full time on my own and i'll get to it someday i can't wait to see when's that happening student loans man <laughs> that's yeah. that's that's the kicker in all of this but i mean uh, it's a, a grave i dug myself it's all self inflicted but uh before we go into rapid fire questions like dude you're dropping some gold on this episode like this is so good oh good um, to hear it, you're killing it man I, I can't wait to hear what you say for this one what's one piece of advice you'd give to a creative who struggles starting or sticking with it yes um you know gary vaynerchuk makes this point a lot and i think a lot of people whether it's just in our generation or just people now need this instant gratification or satisfaction and I think playing for the, the long game, like knowing mm-hmm. that whatever you're doing is going to take a while. You need to put in time, even if it sucks, even if you're not happy with it, even if you're not getting validation, you just need to do it. That kind of goes back to the point of, of just creating to create, you know, and putting it out there without having all of these goals and ideas and plans. Just start doing shit and stuff will start to come, you know, work itself out and come into action. I think working your ass off is extremely important. You know, I average a 60 or 70 hour week and networking. I think that's under undervalued and underestimated the power of networking. Uh, so whether that's directly within the creative world, you know, networking with other agencies or designers, but I've gotten a lot of value out of networking with, with people outside of the creative world. And, and disclaimer by networking, you're not meaning being sleazy, figuring out how you can like, use someone to get to the next step in life. You're talking about building relationships and providing value, mutual benefits and things like that. So some people take networking the wrong way. I totally know you don't because you're one of the most genuine souls I've known, but like, that's what you're meaning, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that clarity. Yeah. um, I mean, exactly that because it's when you sit down and have a conversation with someone and you both are like spitting that passion and Mm -hmm. you know, the ideations going back and forth, it's, that is a, a very memorable connection that you'll have. So when I go in two months and I'm randomly talking with someone who is like looking for a house, well, thankfully I just met with this, you know, mortgage banker, mortgage banker, and, uh, you know, I throw their name out there. So it's like those relationships, you know, really networking to benefit each other, not just yourself will play out so much in the long run. Mm -hmm. You never know who's going to hire you. No, it's, I had a five minute meeting with a creative director back in Cleveland where he basically told me, you know, Hey man, I have a crazy day. I don't really have time for a meeting today. We had a five minute conversation, just like standing up in the cafeteria that was in August. I've gotten between like five and eight grand worth of work that he's passed off to me through people that have reached out to him, that he forwarded them my name from a five minute meeting. So it's like just the power of having a good conversation with someone being genuine and like just being open to the possibilities and how you can potentially help each other has played out so much for me. So I could go on for days about how important I think networking is. No, brilliant, man. It's beautiful. All right, rapid fire questions, dude. If you were on death row, what would your last slice of pizza be? Pineapple pizza with truffle oil. Where? Where the hell you get that? I don't know, but I just think it's a thing somewhere. (laughs) Have you had this before? Did you make this Um, up? I, I had I had pineapple pizza with caramelized onions and truffle oil. Caramelized onions are great. I love them, but I think I want to strip it down a little bit. I think I think I've heard you say you hate fruit on pizza. Is that true? Yeah, it's not my thing. But I love pineapple, just not on my pizza. It's legit. But yeah, I, I'm I'm trying to get fancy with my stuff. Oh, word. Uh, what's something new you learned this week? I re- learn this, relearn it every day. Is the importance of sleep. There's always tomorrow. I always think if I work later or get up earlier, I'll be able to get more done. And that's not the case. You're sleep deprived. You're, you're stupid. You can't think straight. So sleeping important. Uh, that one hits home, dude. I suck at the whole sleep thing for real. I'm a zombie. I'm so bad. Um, what program would you live in each day if you had a choice? Uh, illustrator. If I couldn't choose just pencil and pen. Yes. 
Yes, I'm vibing to you on that. Uh, script serif or sans serif? Uh, script. Yes. Oh my god, dude! Thank you. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, we're like the same person. Uh, what's your favorite typeface? Currently, I love if you're familiar with Sahara Badoni. Mm-hmm. It's uh, yeah, just like a super super chunky, uh, you know, version of Badoni, and it's I've actually never used it on the client work, but it's just so beautiful. Not so much of those thins and the contrast and all that. Uh, it's actually super beefy with uh, like really thin. Um, so the serifs. contrast is even more. Yes, very contrasty. Okay. Yeah, love it. Who's an artist, designer, or creative who's been killing it lately? You know, someone that keeps popping up in your feed. You're like, damn, I can't get enough of them. Uh, I'm going to do two. Zachary Kiernan and uh, Ben Kaczynski. What would their handles be so I can link them up in the show notes? Um, I believe they're both just at Zachary Kiernan and at Ben Kaczynski. Um, they both do an incredible job of type and illustration combination. They're both superstars. Awesome. I actually, I actually ran into Ben at a at a bar in St. Louis, and I was a little buzzed. But I approached him. I'm like, "Hey, man, uh, I really love your work." Oh God, you like, fanboyed. <laughs> yeah, totally fanboyed. Uh, I've done it so many times. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, it's amazing. Word. Uh, you got anything coming up on the horizon you want people to know about? Yeah, um, that Craftsy class that, um, you know, it's an online video course where I teach people it's an intro to hand lettering. So anybody who's interested in learning hand lettering from me, uh, adamvicarell.com or my Instagram is just at Adam Vicarell. And then, you know, various other places throughout the interweb. I'm the only Adam Vicarell out there. So if you search me, you'll find me. I'm so glad we made this happen. Uh, for the listeners, this was supposed to be just a normal talk, but I'm like, screw it. Let's turn it into a podcast episode. And I'm... I feel like I just made the best decision going into 2018, man. You absolutely slayed it. Dude, I really appreciate that. It's truly an honor to be on here. It really is. Yeah, I think you're really going to blow people's minds. I mean, you definitely provided me some value with some things I needed to, you know, hear and I need to act on going into the new year. So appreciate your time, dude. Yeah, likewise, man. You're a huge inspo. <laughs> inspo. All right, man. Take it easy, brother. Love you, man. Love you, too. So there you have it, Adam Vicarell, a really good friend of mine. It's been amazing watching this dude's career take off. And, you know, there's so much that I'm learning from him as I go on how to, you know, continue to be my true self within my work. And I hope uh, it inspires you to, to keep putting your true self within your work as well. It's easier said than done. And to me, Adam is a pro at it. Uh, this week's dose of inspiration goes to my buddy, Josh Grizzly Wheeler of Grizzly Wheeler Print Shop. And this is the madman behind my fighting pizza pens, and he does pins, patches, prints, and apparel for big and small creatives in the industry. This dude gives out easily some of the best prices in the industry for, you know, this type of merch that you want to get started with. And you can see more of the rad work that he helps people like you kick out over at Grizzly Wheeler on Instagram. And feel free to hit him up and say Scotty sent you to go get a quote. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. And if you're enjoying what you hear and you want to support the growth of this show, I have a few ways that you can make that happen. The first is by becoming a backer on patreon.com slash perspective podcast with as little as a cup of coffee each week for you. You can help me continue to build this show, bring people on to help me edit the show and get things scheduled better, uh, buy new equipment, you know, just support the growth of this show. And I try to hook you up with some type of rewards as well. So it's a win-win. And if you decide you want to be a backer, you can join over at patreon.com slash perspective podcast. The second way to support the show is for you crypto heads out there. In the show notes for each episode, I'll have an address for Bitcoin, Ether, or Litecoin donations if you prefer to go that route. And finally, you can leave a ratings and review on iTunes. And please leave the review part as that allows me to give you a nice little thank you plug as it also helps the show get discovered. This week's rating and review comes from Trevor Carlson. Trevor says, First discovered Scotty's podcast last fall, and I've been hooked ever since. He does a great job of getting straight to the point on the inner challenges of being a creative in today's environment. He helps to break down his own struggles in a way that makes me feel less alone in my creative pursuits. His love of pizza gives the podcast a slight twist that makes it fun and unique in its own way. Keep up the great work, Scotty. Trevor, my man, thank you so much, and especially for being a backer on the Patreon recently. That was amazing of you, and just for all the opportunities you've given me. Trevor also hosts a podcast called The Formula Podcast, and he has some of the biggest names in the industry around to help creatives like you as well. 
you know, from a business standpoint as well as a creative standpoint. So big shout out to Trevor. Thank you so much for your support, brother. And as I wrap things up, I need to give a huge thank you to Anya Brennan for making this podcast sound so good all the way from Ireland. And a big thank you to Nick Jenkins of Bluka for all the dope theme music you hear on the show. You can find him on SoundCloud or Instagram at Bluka. That's B-L-O-O-K-H. And as you finish off this week strong, I want to continue to encourage you to keep showing up, keep putting in the work, and keep creating. You got this.